I don't know what most white people in this country feel. I can only include what they feel from the state of their institution. Now, this is the evidence. You want me to make an act of faith, risking myself, my wife, my woman, my sister, my children, on some idealism which you assure me exists in America, which I have never seen. Welcome to Black History for White People, a podcast where we educate, resource, and challenge white people about black history. I'm Brad, and on today's show are my co-hosts, Katina and Garen. Today's topic is Ida B. Wells. We first cover her early life, and then we make our way into her lynching activism and her move to England that started to mount British pressure on America, some of the backlash that she received, her return to America, some specific lynchings, including the Chicago lynching, her work with Susan B. Anthony, the NAACP, and the St. Louis Massacre. We hope you enjoy the discussion. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about Ida B. Wells, but before we dive into the episode, Garen, Katina, we want to take this time to just address a simple question that I would have if I were you as a listener. I would, as I'm hearing the podcast, you may hear ads every now and then, and you're probably like, whoa, ads? That probably means they're making money from it. Where's that money going? So we just want to be kind of upfront and clear about where that money's going. And just so it's very clear, Garen and I are not making money from this podcast. So anything that we do with, you know, Garen spends a lot of time researching. I spend a lot of time doing the back end stuff and we're not making a profit from this. So all that money goes back into projects that we have coming down the pipeline. One of those things is maybe there will be a website in the future where we can kind of put more stuff on the, on the interwebs. Or maybe there's a book, Garen, that we'll be releasing potentially this Maybe. summer. Maybe. May or not, but <laughs> but there is a book know. coming out. So this is the first tease. We don't know when it's going to come out, <laughs> but it's going to come out. It's in the works. It's in the works. And even the money that we made from ad revenue in the past few months went into... Paying Sharifa to edit it. Yeah, paying Sharifa to edit it. And even the people that we want editing it, we want black and brown people to be... Um, Word to Sharifa. That's my girl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully that addresses that. Maybe there's a book. Well, there is a the, book. The Patreon. Oh, and the Patreon money. Great question. The Patreon money will continue to just be raised money that will be given to black and brown organizations or people that are doing really good work. And so you'll hear more as we go further into more episodes about where that money's going. And Sharifa is a content creator and a poetess and writer. And so we're trying to give all of our business to black and brown yeah. creators and creatives and businesses. So that's another way we use our yeah. and leverage and our if you're funds. White, and if you're white and you're like, hey, man, I'd love to, to help you guys out. Well, great. If you'd like to volunteer, volunteer your time or energy, we would, it. we would be open to that. We can talk more about it. But- that's enough of that. Let's get into... Oh, wait. This is, getting this is called reparations, uh-oh. okay? This is what we're trying to do is reparations, is, which is putting our money where our, our mouth is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. On a very small scale, but you yeah. know, we want to keep growing and hopefully we'll be able to... Do it even more. Do it even more. So, mm-hmm. All right. More in the future. But today, we are talking about Ida B. Wells. Ida B. And per the norm, I... <laughs> <laughs> don't know a lot about Ida B. Wells. You don't know a lot about nothing, I, I Brad. I do know that she she wrote stuff. <laughs> and so that's that's about as far as I can go. And so I bet most of our listeners have heard that name. I bet a lot of people have heard Ida B. Wells' name, but can't distinctively say, oh, she did this. Right. And so please inform me as the <laughs> usual, y'all. So help me out. Who is she? Tell me more about her. So per the usual also, I, I like to go into people's story just from the beginning and not tease out why they matter at the beginning. Because when we come into this life, we don't come with a big sign over our head that says what big things we did. We come right. uh, and we're people. We're just normal people. And so I want to just start with her and just follow her through her life. And then as it unfolds, you'll see she was incredible. Cool. Yeah. So Ida B. Wells was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi in 1862. So she was born just slightly before the end of slavery. Mm. So her parents had been married while they were enslaved, and then they remarried after emancipation. Her mom was a famous cook, and her father, Jim, was a carpenter. And he was enslaved by his own father, which ties back into themes we've mentioned about how the masters would rape their slaves. And 
the children that would come from those unions, they would then enslave. And so you can see just the twistedness of that Mm -hmm. um, and that that was part of Ida's own story growing up. Mm -hmm. Her grandpa was the person who she was born enslaved by. Mm. Ida's earliest recollections were of reading a newspaper to her father and an admiring group of his friends. The Freedmen's Aid Society, which is different from the Freedmen's Bureau, it was part of the Methodist Episcopal Church. It had established a school in Ida's hometown called Rust College. It was not initially called that, but they changed the name to Rust College. So Mr. Wells, Ida's father, was a trustee there, and Ida attended there throughout her childhood. So she had access to an education that was actually somewhat of a rare thing at that point. There was no public education system, and a lot of enslaved people didn't have a lot of good access to education. So she was really fortunate in that. And she was a vociferous reader. She loved to read. Her parents would only allow her to read the Bible on Sundays, so she also read the Bible through and through multiple times and was influenced by that. But then fairly early on, her life got pretty difficult. In her teen years, there was an outbreak of yellow fever in Ida's town. And so she was away with relatives, and she had a family friend brought a letter to her, and she opened it up, and it was full of just notes about the progress of the fever. And then she suddenly read the line, Jim and Lizzie Wells have both died of the fever. They died within 24 hours of each other. The children are all at home, and the Howard Association has put a woman there to take care of them. Send word to Ida. Mm. So in that moment, she suddenly realized that she was the oldest sibling And at 14, she was basically an orphan and kind of in charge of her six younger siblings. Wow. So she rushed back. She was away and safe from this yellow fever pandemic. So she rushed back, even knowing that that meant she was likely rushing to her own death. She could get the yellow fever. Right. Everyone was like, why are you going back and pleading with her to stay? The passenger trains weren't even running to the town anymore because of the outbreak. And she actually had to take a freight train there. And she rode on the caboose. And the caboose was draped in black draperies because it was mourning the two previous train conductors who had both died of yellow fever because they were running cargo into this town. Mm. And then even her conversation with the conductor then he was like, I have to do this, but why are you doing this? But she she did it because she loved her siblings and she knew that they needed to be cared for. One of them was a baby and she had a couple sisters, one of whom was crippled, and a couple brothers that were a little bit older, closer in age to her. And when she got back, there was a doctor who had assigned one of his nurses to help take care of her siblings, of the kids. And he did that because Ida's father was really helpful for him. Ida's father was going and praying over and serving and giving basic care to all these people with yellow fever. And that's how he got it. Like he Hmm. risked his own life and ultimately died because he was helping care for people. So, I mean, you can see that Ida's parents left a mark on her with their own integrity. So some friends gathered who were trying to decide. They had like a a meeting to decide what's going to happen with these children. And they decided together that they were going to split them up. That a couple of the friends were going to adopt the sisters. The brothers were going, they were going to find people to apprentice them. And then the sister who was crippled, they were going to send to a poor house because they couldn't think of what else. And, And then Ida, they just decided she's old enough to kind of make it on her own at 14. Yeah. But Ida was not having it. She said, like, no, there's no way you're going to split them up. My parents wouldn't want that. And so she stepped in at age 14 and said, I'm going to take care of them. And so they helped her get a job as a teacher because she did have, you know, more education for her age than many did. So they got her a job as a teacher in a county school. And in those days, there was no transportation to get the six miles out to this rural school in order to teach the children out there. So she had to walk six miles. And so she could only really make the commute. She would actually go out and teach all week, and then she would come back just on the weekends and make all the meals and wash all the clothes for her siblings to give them the basic care. And then during the week, her brothers, who were a little bit older, would kind of take care of the younger siblings. And she worked making $25 a month going and teaching like this. Well, and there's a quote here of her just kind of summing up this experience and how it shaped her. And she said, thus there were six of us left, and I, the oldest, was only 14 years old. 1876, 
After being a happy, light-hearted schoolgirl, I suddenly found myself as the head of a family. I could not imagine at 14 years old being mm-hmm. the head of my family and both my parents. I could not imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, both like grieving that loss and then immediately you have to be an adult. Yeah. Care, like lives depend on you. And being a, being a female, underage female at that time when women, you know, did not have rights, mm-hmm. they were vulnerable, they were, I mean, widows would be preyed on. And here, here's this 14-year-old girl in charge of her siblings, mm-hmm. her younger siblings. Mm-hmm. Wild. Yeah. So somehow, miraculously, she persevered through it. And she succeeded at work to the point that she got a promotion into a city school. And she would commute there with a train, by train. And so as she was taking a train commute on one day, they hadn't yet at this point fully segregated trains, but it was moving that direction. And so what they had started to do was they were forcing black people off of the nicer train car into the smoking car. So the attendant came back and basically said, you have to move to the smoking car from the car that she called the ladies car. But from reading, it sounds like it was just the car that ladies sat in. It wasn't just ladies. And she refused to move. So he grabbed her. And this just tells you a little bit about how she was like feisty. Oh, I. She immediately bit his hand (laughs) and she refused to move. And then he backed up, but then he got two other train workers to come help grab her Mm. and they wrestled her off of the train. She said in her autobiography, she describes that the white people on that train car cheered for them as they pulled her off. Wow. Um, And they stood on their seats to watch and cheered her. So they kicked her off the train. But then even more feisty, she goes and she immediately sues the train company. She gets a lawyer in Memphis, Uh files a lawsuit, and she actually wins. Wow. But it's appealed, and she loses on the appeal. So initially she won, then she lost, and the court, when she lost, ordered her to pay a $200 fee, court fee. She wasn't one to, you know, roll over in the face of injustice. She just immediately, instinctively pushed back Yeah, all through her life. So saddled with that $200 of debt, she had to work twice as hard, even while she continued to raise her siblings and do all that extra work to grow her career as a teacher. And she started somehow on the side to pursue a side gig in contributing to some local church newspapers, little articles. And we talked before about how back in those days, a lot of black activism and activity, like a lot of things fell under the church. Yeah. Because... Other institutions didn't allow black people. And so a lot of newspapers in those days, black newspapers, were through the church. And so she would contribute to some of those, the Evening Star, the Living Way. She started writing letters to them that they would publish weekly. And she started to develop a name for herself, but she was actually not writing under her real name. She was writing under the pseudonym Eola, which that point apparently had kind of like a rural sound to me, I don't... Iola? Fam- yeah, Iola. I'm not familiar with it yeah. enough now to I know, mean, we but. got... In my family, we got violas and violas. Like, the, the those are some pretty old school black names. Yeah. Yeah. But I think she, she chose a name, like a pseudonym, that was a kind of a rural sounding name. Mm-hmm. Because she... Her whole thing was she wanted to speak in a very simple way to explain important truths to her community. So she didn't try to use lofty rhetoric. She said at one point, quote, I never use a word of two syllables where one would serve the purpose. So she wanted to write in a simple way that could get information across her. I like that. that they I love Man, that. I wish more people would just... <laughs> That's so rooted in her faith, though. That's exactly how Jesus talked to and communicated to the people. Mm-hmm. And seeing that she read the Bible several times, and that was her primary book, I mean, it just, I see the tie there. Mm-hmm. That she wasn't trying to show off through through rhetoric, but was trying to, I think I've heard a quote before that said it well, uh, that it's better to take something complex and say it in a way that is simple than to take something that is simple and try to say it in a way that's complex. Mm. Well, and you know what's so cool about her? Because when you think about it, many black people were illiterate. Many people were illiterate. I mean, if she's 14, 15, this is still the late 1800s. And the fact that she kept a posture of humility and wanted to be connected to her people, many of whom had come out of enslavement, many of whom would have been impoverished, many of whom were illiterate. 
her wanting to stay closely connected and have a posture of humility. That says so much, especially knowing that us knowing that she's going to end up going into this work of justice. Yeah, it just says a lot about her character and integrity as a servant. And you can see like the roots of being a teacher that she absolutely taught children. And so she learned how to make no assumptions of what her audience, the kids already knew bring, coming into it and learned how to just boil stuff down to say it simply. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, I even think of Carter G. Woodson's story of yeah. he was very much into teaching children. Mm-hmm. And there, I mean, you, you just have to, you have to know what you're saying to be able to teach it to children. Mm-hmm. Yep. You have to speak with purpose that makes sense. And, you know, yeah, work because words matter. Yep. Yeah. So the the work that she did with the various church papers eventually turned into some small little paid gigs where she would just get like a dollar per contribution for a larger church paper. And then eventually she had the opportunity to buy a share of her own paper. Wow. Um, She bought a one-third share of a paper called The Free Speech in Memphis. And her third share eventually became a 50% share as they bought out one of the other partners. So Okay, Memphis. Come on, Memphis. That's my hometown. Yes, sir. You know what? She is actually the cousin of one of my sorority sisters who I'm very close with. We, she's When you pledge with someone in a black sorority or fraternity, they're called your line sister or line brother. And she was my line sister. And we're still very close to this day. She lives in Memphis. She came to my graduation in December. Her name is Samantha Dr. Samantha Dion Holmes. We share the same middle name. And Ida B. Wells was her cousin. Yeah, that was super cool. Come on, M-10. Small world. Nice. M-10. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wanted to make a smart comment. Be like, can we, can we get that bridge fixed, though? <laughs> don't be coming for us. The bridge is fixed. Is it really? Yeah. yeah good for But them. you're not invited. Don't, hey. don't, don't come across the come bridge. We're mm-hmm. going to throw hands. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. glad that they fixed that bridge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's crazy that that bridge, that crack. I know Just that was pretend crazy. the crack ain't there. <laughs> I know. Jeez, that... man, you shut that bridge down for like a year. Why are you so extra? I'm it's... just saying, it's like the main way to get to Memphis. In the... Cut right, it out. I'll cut it off. Okay, cut okay it off. Garen, we're sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> Another little episode here that shows some of her feistiness. I love this one. So she was a Christian, but she also had no qualms taking on corruption within the church and the Come religious on. leaders of her day. So in one telling episode, there was a minister in Memphis who got caught in an affair. And some of the other ministers were trying to cover it up. And so she was starting to do some investigative journalism on it. And they threatened that if you keep looking into this, we're going to tell our congregations to boycott your paper. So in her next issue, she listed all their names of all the ministers and told her reading audience, are you going to continue to support ministers who are going to leverage their power to cover up an affair? That is my kind of carrying on. A little Rise and Fall podcast Come there. On, back in the, wow. Sis. Yeah. Yeah, she was... <laughs> It's, but it's, I don't think the word feisty does her justice, you know, because that's that's tied to, you know, a little yeah, bit of misogyny. Like, yeah. But, and I know that's not your intent, but I think, I don't know. There's like, she's fierce. Well, it's just like a strength. Fierce that's a like, word. we need that. That's what I'm going we need for. strong women to do things like that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. really, men need that. To show us the way. Men need strong women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yep. She was awesome. But your name in the paper now. <laughs> <laughs> Re- Reverend Dr. Minister so and so. I love it. Just listing names. So she then, and, and this, is, this is the part where, as we're like celebrating the Memphis connection, it's like, well, that's maybe a little early because Memphis does not come through this next part looking good. Mm. Um, so <laughs> come on, sorry, Katina's, Katina's. Sorry, down. Katina. Um, <laughs> Don't come for me. <laughs> <laughs> so there was some friends that she had in Memphis, that, and she was like actually pretty close to these three men who were lynched. Mm. Um, one of them, she was actually the godmother to his child, and his wife was actually pregnant at the time with a second child. So Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Henry Stewart. And the common perception in those days, this is before the turn of the century, this is late 1800s, And most people didn't understand what was really happening with lynching because there was this whole propaganda around it. And so, and we'll see in a minute, Ida has a quote that we'll read about this, but but just know that they didn't realize what you realize if you've listened to our lynching episode was just how there was, in most cases, 
no crime, no real crime behind the lynchings. There was, in most cases, it was just a means of white supremacy enforcing itself on the black population. And that was Ida's view until this happened. And it made her realize, wait a minute, this doesn't fit with the propaganda. These, these guys were guilty of nothing. You right. literally just killed them because they were competing with you. So Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Henry Stewart owned and operated a grocery store. They had scraped together money to buy a grocery store in Memphis, in the black community. Mm. But there was a, a white-owned grocery store that was already in the same black community charging exorbitant prices, overcharging the black people. And so they were competing with this white grocer who then was furious for the competition because it was, it was threatening you know, his corrupt livelihood. And so this all boiled over because some children were playing a marbles game that the black child won fair and square. The white parents beat up, like hit the black child. That boiled into a larger altercation where parents were fighting for the protection of, of their children that had just been beat up. They whipped the they, black child. Oh mm. yeah, I forgot that. They whipped the black child. And so then this all boiled over where the, the white grocer was making threats that they were going to raid the black grocery store. So he, he basically monopolized the moment. Mm-hmm. He took advantage of the moment and directed everyone towards the grocery store. Yeah. And this is so often how these events would happen. Yep. Like the, the, the various race riots, massacres that happened, usually there was the real reason and then there was the propaganda reason. So generally speaking, there was a lot of tension that was there because in a lot of cases, a little bit later on than this episode, in a lot of cases, it was because black labor was used to break white strikes. So there'd be white striking unions. 20 of the largest unions didn't allow black people in. Mm. And so the white labor would strike and then the capitalists would bring in black strike breakers. And so then there would be resentment towards these black workers. The irony is if you just let them into the union, then you would all collectively bargain together. Absolutely. But then rather than being mad at the the capitalists for playing them against each other, they would use terrorism against the black strike breakers. And that was the real reason behind like the St. Louis massacre or the Atlanta massacre or the Wilmington massacre. Like a lot of these massacres were because of these real reasons. But then the propaganda reason would be something about a rape or something about, you know, a marbles game or something, you know, it would be like, there would be some kind of spark that would happen or the Tulsa massacre. It was the incident with on the elevator. So there's the propaganda reason that would be used to kind of rally the troops to, to commit the violence. So it never took much and it was always brimming underneath the surface anyway, just this resentment and jealousy against black people for being on the come up, basically, Mm -hmm. as we say. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. So in this case, the white people threatened the black grocery store. The black people asked their lawyer, like, how do we defend ourselves? Because they're threatening to loot us. And he said, well, you're outside of the city limits. So the police are not going to come if you call them. Mm. Which that in of itself is part of a systemic racism of that day because the they were in the black community and the black community was outside the city limits. Like the police lines were drawn to exclude the part of Memphis where the black people lived. Well, and they weren't going to come anyway, but then black people could not even live in the same community as white people. So there, then there's that as well. Yeah, yeah there's enforced segregation. Yeah. And then the lawyer said, because the police won't come, you are in your rights to defend yourself. So they hired guards, armed guards, to Mm. defend their grocery store. And then sure enough, a couple nights later, they heard looting through the back of the grocery store. And Mm. white men were coming into the grocery store and starting to take items. And so the guards fired and injured some of these white looters. Mm. So then everyone wakes up the next day. And in Memphis, the white papers have printed that officers of the law have been injured discharging their duties, hunting criminals whom they were told were harbored in the People's Grocery Company. This being a low dive in which drinking and gambling were carried on, a resort of thieves and thugs. Mm. That's what the white papers are printing, saying that these were officers, which they weren't and that were injured in the course of their duty. So over 100 black men were dragged from their homes and jailed on suspicion of being involved. And by white papers, we're talking about the commercial appeal, which is still a prominent paper in Memphis. Speaking of reparations. Come on. Yeah, that need to happen. Mm-hmm. So then there was concern that there would be a lynching. And so other black 
men started to take up arms and guard the jail to make sure that lynchers couldn't go in and lynch the owners, the, these three men who were, owned the People's Grocery Store, the People's Grocery Company, because they knew that that was what was really wanted. But then it was announced that the supposed police officers, that these white men were going to be fine. They were going to recover. And there was kind of like a collective sigh of relief because they thought, okay, the trouble's passed then. So these guards left. And then after they left and after it was known that the white men would be fine, a lynch mob came and Mm -hmm. got the men. Of course. And they took them outside of town and they killed them. Thomas had pleaded for his life for the sake of his wife and baby and another baby that was on the way, but they didn't show him mercy and instead they gouged out his eyes and then shot him. Mm. It was later learned through Ida's investigative reporting that every major white man of power in Memphis, and this was like her quote, how she described it. So I'm not sure how wide of a circle that really means, but she said the leading white men of Memphis had all signed off on the lynching. It was something that had been like decided through the power structure. And they believed that the judge was actually one of the lynchers, was actually partially responsible. And then they couldn't even, like the black people of Memphis couldn't even gather to grieve what had happened. They began to gather and grieve outside the grocery store and word came of the grief and a growing crowd. Word came to the city hall where a judge ordered that the sheriff take a hundred men and shoot on sight any Negro who appears to be making trouble. Hmm. is what they said so gangs of white men obeyed and the judge's order and they began to shoot into crowds of black people to get them to disperse Mm -hmm. Um, i don't think they actually shot anyone but they were threatening to and so there was no space to grieve and then meanwhile a white mob looted the people's grocery company and destroyed anything they couldn't steal so then ida's response yes her fierce response was to rally the people the black people in memphis to leave the city That was basically the only tool that black people had in the face of lynching and oppression was to vote with their feet Yeah, because they had no institutional ability to get justice, but the white people needed their labor, needed their, their help in the economy. And so the only way they could really push back was to leave. So Ida wrote in an issue of the free speech, quote, The city of Memphis has demonstrated that neither character nor standing avails the Negro if he dares to protect himself against the white man or become his rival. There is nothing we can do about the lynching now as we are outnumbered and without arms. The white mob could help itself to ammunition without pay, but the order was rigidly enforced against the selling of guns to Negroes. There is therefore only one thing left that we can do, save our money and leave a town which will neither protect our lives and property nor give us a fair trial in the courts, but takes us out and murders us in cold blood when accused by white persons. And in response, hundreds of black people left Memphis and moved away. Entire, two entire congregations moved out of town in mass. She wrote something else in Justice Impossible. Oh, yeah. And it says, No one has been arrested or punished about the terrible affair, nor will they be because all are equally guilty. Why don't the colored people find the guilty ones? Asked one of them as if they could. There is a strong belief among us that the criminal court judge himself was one of the lynchers. Suppose we had the evidence. Could we get it before that judge? or a grand jury of white men who had permitted it to be, or forced the reporter of appeal to tell us what he saw that night, you know very well that we are powerless to do any of these things. She was, she cut, her words cut like a knife. Mm -hmm. She spoke. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And people listened and they moved away and the the white papers started to get nervous because they're like, everyone is leaving. So the white papers responded by printing basically these horror stories of all the terrible things that they made up that were happening to all these black people who had left Memphis. So they were talking about Indian attacks of people who were leaving or or just these black neighbors that had moved away or all starving and dying of starvation. But it was propaganda. It wasn't real. Right. And so Ida went to investigate and she went out and found these people from the Memphis diaspora, people who had left Memphis. Yeah. And she started to send back their accounts and how they were doing fine and how some of them had found better opportunities outside of Memphis. And so the free speech started publishing those and people continued to leave. Black people continued to leave. And there was like a little celebration in the black community every time new people would leave. 
Yeah. Because they were all, not all of them had the financial Wherewithal. ability yeah. to leave. Some of them were kind of trapped in their circumstances. But anytime someone would leave, it was like the little way that they had to push back against the oppression that they were all facing. Mm. Yeah. So then the white mob knew, and I say the white mob, that like all the white people who were complicit in all this violence that was happening, they knew that they couldn't just burn down the free speech without triggering even more people to leave. But they also knew that as long as Ida keeps publishing these things, more black people keep leaving and it's hurting the local economy. I mean, for instance, this white grocer who had his little monopoly, all his customers are moving away. So he's losing money as they leave town. So they wanted to destroy the free speech, but they had to wait till they had an excuse to do it. And that excuse came when Ida published an anonymous editorial that basically said, this whole thing about rape being used as an excuse to lynch black men is not believable. It's not, you guys are making it up. And she basically insinuated that what was really happening is that white women and black men were having just adulterous relationships that would be discovered and that the white woman uh, <laughs> would then say it was a rape in order to get out from the stigma. Of- Come on, sis! So she, she called it out. <laughs> <laughs> and the white people were so incensed by this that they burned the free speech down. And the white paper said that whoever wrote the editorial should be tied to a stake at the corner of Main and Madison streets and a pair of tailor shears used on him. And he should then be burned at the stake. So that, I mean, if you didn't catch it, I mean, it's a, an allusion to castration because they thought that it was a man who had printed it. Wow. But actually it had been Ida who... I mean, thankfully, she had published it anonymously, so they didn't know to kill her. But she was out of town when that threat was made and when they burned the paper down. So she herself was safe. She was then advised not to come back into town, which she didn't do. There was actually black men who organized themselves to protect her if she did come back into town. And they said that white men were scouring the trains to take her and kill her if she should reappear. And they were organizing themselves to protect her, saying, or, or they said, but if you come back, it will probably make orphans and widows of our families. Man. So basically saying, we will fight to protect you, mm-hmm. but also knowing it's likely to cost our lives to do so. And that they had to be put in the position to do that. Not that I know when it says Madison and Maine, I know exactly where that is. Hmm. Like... I have driven those streets many a time. I mean, and just to think that just barely a century ago, people were being taken there to be lynched. Mm. My God. Yeah. The same spaces that we occupy have this history, this spiritual shadow hanging over them. Yeah. That's never been really dealt with or properly dealt with. And the blood still cries from the ground. Hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. So Ida says of all this, quote, Like many another person who had read of lynchings in the South, I had accepted the idea that was meant to be conveyed that although a lynching was irregular and contrary to law and order, unreasoning anger over the terrible crime of rape led to the lynching, that perhaps the brute deserved the death anyhow, and the mob was justified in taking his life. But Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Lee Stewart had been lynched in Memphis, one of the leading cities of the South, in which no lynching had taken place before, with just as much brutality as other victims of the mob, and they had committed no crime against the white woman. This is what opened my eyes to what lynching really was, an excuse to get rid of Negroes who were acquiring wealth and property, and thus to keep the race terrorized and keep the, you should use the N-word, down. Wow. So she realized, like, it kind of took the veil off of her eyes to see this is what's really happening. Like, their crime was that they were chasing the American dream and becoming entrepreneurs. They mm. were starting a grocery store to bypass this corrupt system of being overcharged that the white grocers were imposing on them. That was their crime. And for that, they were killed. And then there begins the forerunning of the lynching memorial that we have and the EJI, if you really think about it. Yeah. Which is her work. If you guys haven't seen that in, it's Montgomery, Alabama? Yeah. Yeah, in Montgomery, Alabama, Equal Justice Initiative has one of the most powerful memorials I've ever seen. And you should, I mean, at the very least, next time you're planning a a vacation, try to add that as a stop on it and spend some time there at the the memorial. They, They have a museum and a memorial. They're both incredibly powerful. 
I would love to do an episode on Montgomery. I know that, that that's like, that's the capital of Alabama, I think. I think so. Right? Yeah. And I know that it was like a very racially charged city, one of the main ones in the South. Mm-hmm. So as Ida looked at that lynching and saw what was really happening, she started to look at other lynchings too and see that that was a general pattern. And she was a journalist and a teacher still kind of, but a journalist at this point more and more. And she started to investigate. So where'd she go if she's, she's not in Memphis anymore? New York initially. Eventually she moved to Chicago. So she, uh, just to like take lynchings from one year, I'm just going to describe some of these and what was actually happening. So this is all from just one year. John Peterson, lynched in South Carolina, was described by the white woman to be the wrong man. But the mob that had gathered said that somebody had to pay anyways, and so they lynched him, even knowing that he was the wrong man. Three other men in Columbia, South Carolina, were lynched because the mob said that they wanted to be sure that they got the right one. In Tennessee, a man was lynched on suspicion, and another was lynched because he didn't stop walking when told to stop. In Alabama, eight men were lynched on suspicion of crimes. One was lynched because he assaulted a white woman, but in reality what was meant by that was that he had jumped up onto a wagon and had startled three white women, had asked for food, and then having been denied, he got down and and walked off. And for that, he was lynched. What, what isn't included here, but what you can... And if you want to understand lynching more, we did a whole episode on it, so I'd refer you back to that, is that many men were also lynched for just political participation, for voting, for striking or organizing to strike in labor, or for trying to register people to vote. That was often what, what was really behind a lynching. And I know we talked about it in the episode, I think that was like episodes three and four, one of the first ones we did. But you know, I, even as you explain some of those stories, there's an anger in me that's like, oh, I'm so mad. Like I want to like hurt those white people. <laughs> and then there's like a really, there's a big sadness that's like, oh my gosh, this one was murdered in front of people. And it was like a group. It wasn't like a secret mission of one person. But what do you say to someone who's listening to that and is just, you know, the reality is that justice probably didn't happen. I know a lot of times there were no charges. And in a lot of times, even when there were charges, they were just dropped. It's almost like they just appeased people by putting them in court. But then the white juries would just be like, ah, you're fine. Mm-hmm. So justice more than likely did never happen for any of those. I wrestle with that because I'm like, that doesn't compute in my brain. So what would you say to somebody who's like, that's infuriating and there's nothing I can do about it? Why can't there be something done about it? Mm. I think that part of it is we need to grieve what happened. And we also need to learn the lesson of the power that hate can have and how dangerous it is. Yeah, Because we like to think that we are somehow today fundamentally different from these people. But the only fundamental difference between us and them, we're made out of the same human stuff. The difference is that we live in a society right now that has justice, that won't tolerate this. But it's a mistake to think that this could never happen again because it was the system all throughout the South. I mean, there was, you alluded to this, in less than 1% of lynchings were the white people who were responsible convicted. And even then, even when they were convicted, there's only one instance in all of American history prior to the civil rights movement where a white person received first degree murder charges for killing a black person. There's exactly one instance. And so there is this rampant injustice that happened because of this whole system, including like the propaganda and everything. And we need to learn the lessons from that because some of those same elements are powerful political tools that people can try to reintroduce into society to gain more power today. And if we're not aware of history and of how, how we need to deliberately counteract the evil that can be conjured up in the hearts of people, we can't be loving towards our neighbors if we're not learning history and learning the lessons from it. But we don't live in a just, just world of society. I mean, because we are ex- experiencing modern day lynchings mm-hmm. and people have just as little sympathy now as they did then. I mean, which complicit, being complicit is just like tying the noose. When you are saying that George Floyd somehow deserved being lynched or Ahmaud Arbery deserved to be lynched, 
And that's what a lynching is. I mean, you, you might say, well, they weren't hung up in trees, but... But lynchings didn't always involve being right. hung up in trees either. Right. They, they were lynched. And there are still people, there are people today, just like there were people then that would say, well, he was a criminal. He did drugs. He didn't live in that neighborhood. He was still in copper. And a lot of that stuff is just made up. And some of it, yeah, just because someone may have been a criminal and served time previously doesn't mean that they need to be publicly lynched for just existing in another moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, today, I mean, there's so many modern parallels to the injustice of the past that we can uproot in our modern system, too. It's like there's things that happened back then that I think wouldn't happen today, but then there's descendants of those same things that do happen today. Right. And justice is not yet complete. We have not yet arrived. Yeah, just like the no-knock warrants. And the young man who was mm-hmm. killed in his home. I mean, we see a video of the police just unlocking his door and going in and killing him. Mm-hmm. It's still happening. And unfortunately, it's happening by uh, law enforcement, at the hands of law enforcement, which mob justice back then, a lot of times, like Ida was saying, the judge was a participant, police officers, sheriffs, you know, law officials, they were participants. They were the ones that were lynching. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, we just want to let you know about a new season of a popular cultural podcast called Spectacle. Um, season two, they're going to be diving into all things Las Vegas. It's a city deep with racial problems and a complicated history. I think we can all agree that Las Vegas is not a normal city. And I think we can assume that its past is probably full of a lot of crazy stories. This podcast guides you through how Las Vegas came to be and how the city defines our understanding of popular culture from the mob to marriage and everything else. Subscribe and listen to the new season of Spectacle, Las Vegas, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. So getting back into Ida's story. Yeah. She was banished from Memphis, and so she went to New York, like I said, and there she actually was able to buy into a new newspaper in New York by basically trading her old subscription list for 25% equity, which means that she stayed connected to her same kind of audience that had been subscribed to the free speech just only now under this new paper and had an even larger audience. So that new paper was called The New York Age, and she continued to publish for them and began to do more and more work investigating various lynchings that were happening. So one quote from her as she kind of talks about just unveiling the system of lynching, she says, quote, As soon as white Southerners came into power, they began to make playthings of Negro lives and property. This still seemed not enough to keep the N-word down. Hence came lynch law to stifle Negro manhood which defended itself in the burning alive of Negroes who were weak enough to accept favors from white women. The many unspeakable and unprintable tortures to which the Negro, and she has in quotes, uh, rapist of white women were subjugated were for the purpose of striking terror into the hearts of other Negroes who might be thinking of consorting with willing white women. I found that in order to justify these horrible atrocities to the world, the Negro was being branded as a race of rapists who were especially mad after white women. I found the white men who had created a race of mulattoes by raping and consorting with Negro women were still doing so wherever they could. These same white men lynched, burned, and tortured Negro men for doing the same things with white women, even while the white women were willing victims. It seemed horrible to me that death in its most terrible form should be meted out to the Negro who was weak enough to take chances when accepting the invitations of these white women, but that the entire race should be branded as moral monsters and despoilers of white womanhood and childhood was bound to rob us of all the friends we had and silence any protest they might have made for us. For all these reasons, it seemed a stern duty to give the facts that I had collected to the world. Hmm. So she's recognizing and publicizing that this is what's really going on here. There's these consensual relationships that are then being branded as rape after the fact, which actually was like effective propaganda, even black leaders. She talks in her autobiography about how even Booker T. Washington was basically believing the propaganda and not speaking against the lynchings. Like he pointed out that they were, you know, extrajudicial and not good, but wasn't exposing that they were based on lies and that this wasn't real. 
So she was the first loud voice that really began to expose lynchings for what they really were. And what's crazy, though, is that a lot of these lynchings, there weren't even accusations of rape. They just lynched people because they wanted to lynch them. She speaks so powerfully when she talks about black men and white women being in consensual relationships and how when white men would, by and large, rape black women, and that went on, went on even throughout Jim Crow, it was acceptable. And they would have babies that they would enslave, you know, but they would also have mulatto children that were subject to oppression, further oppression that they did not protect, but that somehow a white woman and a black man doing the same thing, but more on a consensual level than what white men were doing to black women, that was just a heinous crime on white manhood, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In most cases, she points out that the allegation of rape didn't even come until after lynchings were made public. So right. oftentimes that was like the pr propaganda added after the fact. Yeah. It was like, oh, well, we did it because he had raped someone. But in investigating them, found that that was not even there during many lynchings, which yeah. was added. So all this work that Ida began to do started to get her some recognition in England. And that was actually kind of the next big chapter of her life was she actually became quite famous in England, probably about as famous in England as she is here. Because England had a movement that had been involved in abolition in America. There was a lot of activists there that helped with the cause of abolition that now was turning its attention towards fighting against lynching. And they brought Ida over multiple times to be a speaker and to illuminate to them what was happening in the South. So she accepted an invitation that brought her to Aberdeen and Newcastle and Birmingham and Manchester, had various speaking engagements, uh, met with a lot of you know, various people, including important people, MPs in the government. I love what she said when she spoke to Englanders. And she said, because they, the question was, you know, what do we have to do with something that's happening a thousand miles away? And she said, it is to the religious and moral sentiment of Great Britain we now turn. These can arouse the public sentiment in America so necessary for the enforcement of law. The moral agencies of Great Britain did much for the final overthrow of chattel slavery. America cannot and will not ignore the voice of a nation who is her superior in civilization, which makes this demand injustice and humanity. So basically saying, you guys are going to have to leverage your power because they're not listening to us and we live there. It's going to take European, this European country from which America was birthed to put pressure on them to stop what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they care what you say, what you think, so leverage that power for yeah. the good of others. And, and England did powerfully, and we're going to read a little bit of that in the next section when we talk about her second visit. Some of the things that they did were really interesting and kind of strategic how they put pressure on America. But first, just want to throw in a little interesting nugget. Ida ended up being one of the first foreign correspondents, maybe the first black foreign correspondent for an American newspaper when she went to England. The Interocean was a paper that she gave some good press to because she told on her first trip to England, she said that they were one of the only papers in America that was standing against lynching. And so then when she returned, the Interocean paid her to be their correspondent to England during her trip. And this actually, to Ida's knowledge, and I don't know, we'd have to fact check if this is true, but to her knowledge, this made her the first paid correspondent for any white paper in America. So one of the first, or maybe the first, black person, period, much less black women, to be a journalist in America and a white paper. Okay, so, so what did England do? What did Great Britain do to pressure America. There's more things than we can list here, but just to give an example few, there was a reverend there, Reverend Akit, who was a popular reverend, had a large following, and he visited America where he encountered a planned lynching. And he talked in England about how 40 million Americans had the lynching announced to them in advance because papers were publishing it in advance and, and a wide readership and that no one lifted a finger to do anything about it. And before he had left America, evidence had already come to light that the mob had lynched the wrong man. So he started raising, you know, going on circuit and talking about that. And then the Guardian, a major British publication, printed Quote, there is a contemptuous kindness for the American Negro, so long as he remains a hewer of wood and a drawer of water, with aspirations carefully suppressed, but as soon as he claims the position of a citizen of a free country, the whole force of social pressure is exerted to keep him down. 
the hangings, shootings, burnings of Negroes who have not been convicted of any crime bring disgrace upon the American nation, and those who take part in these murders or condone them are the deadliest foes of the free institutions of which America claims to be, in a special sense, the home. So just fiercely calling out American racism in the system and showing the the hypocrisy of how this cuts against the ideals that America claims to hold. And then what ended up happening is that the white activists who were working with Ida B. Wells, every morning they started to wake up and they looked at this Guardian article or other articles that were being published and they found whichever newspaper had the best, most favorable coverage of Ida B. Wells' campaign through England. And so they got these newspapers every day, different major London newspapers that were printing things showing the American hypocrisy through lynchings. And they bought a hundred copies of each one. And then they started to send those to every American governor, to the U.S. president, and to all the major American newspapers. So every day, all of these politicians and every major American newspaper started getting copies of London paper after London paper showing the British railing against America for the lynchings that we here just accepted as a matter of life and didn't push back on. Mm. And in that way, they started to raise this kind of peer pressure against lynchings. And this started to form a backlash. Ida B. Wells got name-called. There was actually one of the Memphis papers published an incendiary and horrible, slanderous account trying to tear apart Ida's character. But it actually backfired because as Londoners, they sent it, they flooded London with copies of this Memphis newspaper in order to try to just sow doubt about Ida. But the newspaper was so full of profanity that Londoners were offended and shocked that these things would even be printed. And so it backfired and they it just made the newspaper lose credibility and kind of exposed, oh wow, this is like what she's saying is actually happening. Look how the lengths that they're going through to suppress her. So this, this started to put significant pressure on America, and it also raised the profile of Ida as a civil rights worker. And so then she came back to America and moved to Chicago, and she received, like, she had an increased profile at this point, so she re- received a half dozen job offers for relatively lucrative jobs, but she turned them all down because they would have pulled her away from her campaign against lynching. She married a lawyer and a journalist and a fellow newspaperman named Ferdinand Lee Barnett, and he also was actively involved in some of the same work. She had actually contributed to some of the same works that he'd been like a co-author with her on some things so then she was living in chicago after she married she had four kids and they had settled down in chicago and in 1909 in chicago there was another lynching and in chicago a white woman was found dead in an alley and the police did what was kind of typical status quo custom for them they just rounded up black men nearby and one of the men just couldn't account for his whereabouts and so they arrested him and charged him with the murder even though there was no real evidence that he had done it so a mob formed and hung him over a light pole shot him 500 times and then took him to a place where the woman had been found and they decapitated him and then burned his body and even as i read some of these accounts of lynchings it, it feels bad even to read it yeah. Because of just the level of barbarity, the lack of humanity in it. And actually, Ida B. Wells faced the same accusation. People were slandering her for describing the lynchings that were happening and saying it was not ladylike. But she shot back and said, I'm, I haven't done a single one of these. I wouldn't in my darkest nightmares dream of doing the things that have happened. And if the South cared half as much about protecting the lives of black people as they do about trying to defend these lynchings that are happening, I wouldn't have to keep describing them. They were absolutely horrible. It's important for us to know the the level to which depravity climbed because that's part of history. And you have to build a worldview that makes sense of this. Like you have to have a worldview developed to the point that you can make sense of this. And that means for most white people, that's going to force you to rethink what American history is to account for this. But if you haven't done that, you're not accounting for real history because this really happened. These really happened. Humanity got to the point where they did these things and where it was widely known, oftentimes attended by thousands of people who would bring their children. They would often schedule lynchings on Sundays in order to that the church crowd could go and watch. And this is part of American history. Well, 
I think it's important to note that when the Chicago lynching happened, Ida decided that she wasn't going to go and report on it. But her husband encouraged her to report on it. She had already been, you know, accused of jumping ahead of black male leadership. So the misogynoir was in place as much as the misogyny. But her husband, who was the head of their home, encouraged her to go forward. And so it talks about how she was refusing to go, and her 10-year-old son woke her up and said, it's time to go. Papa says it's time to go. And she said she didn't, she didn't know why she should have to go if no one else was willing to. And he basically said, Ma, if you don't go, no one else will. And so she actually went and came, went, because, because the sheriff, he had been suspended for his role in the lynching. And Wells went to the meeting with the governor where his appeal was being made, and she carried a resolution from the black population asking that he be permanently suspended. And she, you know, of course, as the the speaker that she is, I mean, she gave a compelling argument, and he wasn't reinstated. And everyone supported, all the white people supported him being reinstated, but because of her, he was not. That is huge. Mm -hmm. And after that, there were no more lynchings in Chicago. Yeah. That every time after that, that a a lynching started to foment, the sheriffs would call in the National Guard because they know like, oh, we can actually lose our job because of this. And it was because this one sheriff was held accountable. Yeah. And that was because Ida B. Wells came when she didn't have to because no one else would. And she stood up, and and, and I mean, even painting the picture, here she was in this courtroom-like setting before the governor, and there were lawyers that were there representing Davis, and then she described it, she says, there was the attorney of Alexander County, the U.S. Land Commissioner, and a half a dozen other representative white men who had journeyed here to comfort Frank Davis and to fight for his reinstatement. And then they had with them letters from Democrats and Republicans, bankers, lawyers, doctors, editors of both daily papers, heads of women's clubs and men's organizations, all in support of Frank Davis. So Ida says the whole of the white population was evidently behind his reinstatement. Mm. It was basically her against the world, her against the entire white establishment. And she somehow spoke in that moment, in that clutch moment, in such a compelling way that this governor decided against all of that to go ahead and let the ruling stand that he should lose his job, which was kind of a shock at the time. Everyone expected him to be reinstated, but that actually brought lynchings in Chicago to an end, even though Chicago after that had a lot of racial problems. I mean, even as recently as the 1990s, the Chicago Police Department was actively torturing black men in order to get them to confess to crimes, oftentimes crimes they didn't commit. So Chicago had a lot of racial problems, but they didn't have lynchings after that because the sheriffs didn't want to lose their jobs. And once that accountability was there and real, it brought them to an end. Imagine that. Hmm. Imagine that. Which, yeah, I mean, that's such an indictment against what, that's not even like real justice. He just lost his job. Right. Like he didn't even actually go to jail, face real consequences. <laughs> like j- just even this little paltry consequence was enough to bring them to an end in it. Like how many thousands of American lives were lost unnecessarily because of the widespread complicity of the whole system to look the other way. Yeah. Yeah. She was definitely a black woman suffragist. Mm-hmm. Yep. She she actually, through her work with suffrage, she met and associated with Susan B. Anthony. She, at one point, there's this interesting episode where she was invited over to Susan B. Anthony's home, and Susan told her that she could use her secretary. She said, hey, you can like dictate to her. She'll write down what you say. And so Susan left. And then she comes back later and says, like, oh, wait, she sees Ida writing by hand her little speech. And she says, like, did my secretary not come up here? She was supposed to come up here and let you dictate to her. And then Ida says, like, no, she never came. Susan B. Anthony goes, finds her secretary. And the secretary says to her, it's all right for you, Miss Anthony, to treat the Negroes as equals, but I refuse to take dictation from a colored woman. (laughs) And then Anthony fired her on the spot. So, so that was great, but Susan B. Anthony also did have some issues where she compromised. I think she, from, from the descriptions that Ida gives, um, Susan B. Anthony seemed to care about racial justice, but she cared more about women's suffrage, and she at times compromised racial justice in pursuit of suffrage. And specifically white women's suffrage. Yes. She yeah. was 
problematic. Yeah, and she she kind of admitted this to Ida. They had a conversation where she said, like, hey, we, we at times in the South will basically go along with the social system there because I know, oh, Susan B. Anthony is saying, I know that if women get the vote, that that's going to help bring lynchings to an end. Is it okay? Is that okay that I do this? And then Ida immediately said, like, no. This is, you're compromising and you're actually making the work harder because you're reinforcing to those Southern women who look up to you that that system is okay. And so Ida B. Wells says in that moment she felt heard by Anthony, but I don't think Anthony completely changed what she was doing. I yeah. think I think Anthony was kind of like, I think in a, if she had her way, she would have been racially wanting black women to have the vote, but she was willing to give that up and she compromised. Right, which means that she didn't care about true women, women's suffrage, but that's a whole mm-hmm. another argument for mm-hmm. another day. Yep. The episode's <laughs> not on Susan B. Anthony. Right. Um, Back to Ida. Yep. <laughs> Ida also was foundational in the start of the NAACP. In our episode on W.B. Du Bois, you'll remember that he edited The Crisis. That was a really impactful publication. It only existed because of Ida B. Wells. The initial founders at the meeting that was deciding whether or not to start the crisis or whether to just use existing journals to publish articles, most of them were on the side of like, let's just use existing journals. Let's not take on the work of starting our own publication. And that was kind of the temperature of the room. But then Ida spoke up and she was strongly convinced that, no, we should start our own publication because if we use existing white controlled journals, we're going to have to boil down what we say in order to just say only what they're willing to print. And they're not going to be willing to print everything. So she basically said, let's just do our own thing. And they did. And thus the crisis was born largely because of her being in the room. Yeah. Which just shows the importance of black women being in the room where decisions are made. Yes. Then she was accused of treason. Oof, yeah, these ones are intense. During World War I, there, was, there were soldiers who were lynched. And Ida spoke out and did like a rally against these. She made buttons that she was distributing in order to raise awareness and push back against these lynchings of black soldiers who were being lynched by, in the army, like with army sanction. And while she was doing this, two Secret Service agents walked into her store and demanded the buttons and said that if she didn't turn them over, they would arrest her for treason. And they said that if she was in Germany, she already would have been taken out and shot. (laughs) So they were threatening, even kind of insinuating killing her. And I mean, the word treason has death associated with it. Like you can be killed for treason. They were threatening that if she continued to expose the ways in which the army was lynching black soldiers. But ultimately they were bluffing because she, she stood her ground. She refused to give the buttons over. She refused to change it. And she just said flat out, I'm not going to stop. So do what you got to do. And they just said, well, talk to your lawyer. And then they stormed out and they didn't arrest her. So it was kind of a bluff. But then meanwhile, I'm just on that theme of government involvement. The FBI also had a file on her that now we have, it's been, you know, declassified, so we have access to. And Ida had been appointed to attend the Versailles Peace Conference in Paris. That was at the end of World War I. Mm. And the FBI blocked her passport and she ultimately wasn't able to go. She was going to be at this conference that would have been with world leaders where she could have pleaded the cause of racial justice to these world leaders. And and that was blocked by the FBI who said in their intelligence file, quote, we have on file quite a few reports from different cities where she has addressed meetings of colored people and endeavored to impress upon them that they are a downtrodden race and that now is the time for them to demand and secure their proper position in the world. She is a very effective speaker, and her influence upon the colored race is well recognized. I believe she is considered by all of the intelligence officers as one of the most dangerous Negro agitators, and it would seem that her case should be considered very carefully before she is given a passport to the peace conference. Wow. It's like the first part almost seems positive. They're saying like she is helping black people realize that they are a downtrodden race. They were very downtrodden back then. That's like completely a true accusation. And to rise up and take their proper position, which is like a description of the American dream. Like that's what it is. Like, you know, pull yourself up. It almost sounds positive. And then they say she and and they say she's like an effective speaker, influential, well recognized. And they say she's very dangerous. And then you realize like, oh, you mean all this negatively. 
you don't want black people to become anything more than second-class citizens. And when you say dangerous, what you mean is that she's effective at helping black people rise up from being a lower caste. And so they denied her passport in order to take power from her. And that's the FBI, the American government. So then after this, there was a massacre in St. Louis, and Ida went to investigate that. She was quickly detained as soon as she got there because they were worried that she carried smallpox or had smallpox, but then she was the only person. She was on a train with white people, and none of them were detained, which if you really thought she had smallpox, you would you know quarantine the whole train. But she managed, after going through some hassle, she managed to investigate that riot that had killed 150 black residents of St. Louis. I alluded to earlier is because of organized labor and the way that the black people were taking jobs that white people were striking. So Ida published the East St. Louis Massacre pamphlet that detailed what had really happened there, a piece of investigative journalism. And then after that, a situation developed in Arkansas where 12 black men were tortured into confessing a conspiracy to kill white people, and they were all going to be put to death until Ida intervened. And she wrote a letter to the governor. And this is just so interesting to see the dynamics at play here. She wrote a letter to the governor saying that the defender, her paper, would run a campaign to get black labor to move away from Arkansas if they went forward with killing these men. And that was enough to get the governor to relent because the Arkansas industry needed black labor. And so the black people didn't have the power to bring justice other than by voting with their feet. And six million of them did. Mass migration was this process where six million black people moved from the south up north and west in order to vote with their feet to leave the oppressive systems that they were in because that was the only leverage they really had. And here we see that it was effective enough to get the governor to relent and to, to not put these men to death. And then, not satisfied just to you know, have them have life in prison, Ida went and she snuck into the prison pretending to be a cousin <laughs> And so she, she snuck into prison and interviewed the men and then put together such a compelling case that she started to publicize, showing what was really happening, that the men were ultimately cleared. And what she showed was that the white men were doing the exact same thing to these black men that they accused the black men of doing to them. That they had, in fact, the white men, had, in fact, made a conspiracy to kill them because all these black men, these 12 black men, were all land and cattle owning. And after they were imprisoned, all their land and cattle had been taken by this group of white men. So the whole, the motive, the justification of what was really going on behind it was that they wanted their land and cattle. And so they had conspired and then seized all of their property. And after a, this big national outcry that Ida was able to foment, the men were acquitted and released. So Ida's biography basically ends there. Her autobiography ends mid-sentence. She wasn't able to completely finish it. She ultimately died of kidney failure in Chicago on March 25th, 1931, at the age of 68. And she was buried in Oakwood Cemetery on Chicago's south side. But she changed the world. She yeah. was fierce and she was, I think, a, I mean, what a role model for every little boy and girl in America, white or black. Like she is an encapsulation of what it means to love and serve and fight for others, caring for her siblings from a young age when she needed to step up and sacrificing for her people, sacrificing, like getting up and going on trains because no one else would go. And I mean, she's, I think, <laughs> one of my favorite role models that yeah. that we've had the opportunity to cover. I'm she's a hero. Her. She's a fierce advocate. Just, yeah, this has been one of my favorites to discuss and just kind of unpack her life. What an amazing woman of God, warrior, justice advocate, voice for the voiceless. I mean, man. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you're looking for more information on what we discussed, take a look at the show notes or go to blackhistoryforwhitepeople.com. If you'd like to play a supportive role in the podcast, you can support us on Patreon for $5 a month at patreon.com backslash blackhistoryforwhitepeople. On our next episode, we're going to be discussing Sidney Poitier. We'll leave you with this quote from Lila Watson. If you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you recognize that your liberation and mine are bound up together we can walk together.